My name is Stephen Henry Madoff. I'm the founding chair of the master's program in curatorial practice at the School of Visual Arts in New York. And um, each week we have a distinguished curator or director who comes to speak about exhibitions or curatorial projects that have been important to them in their own work, in their own practice that have been transformative in some way. And uh, with me today, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Andrea Lissoni. I'll just say a few words about Andrea. He's the artistic director of Haus der Kunst in Munich. Before coming to Munich, Andrea was the senior curator of international art at Tate Modern, where he launched a yearly cinema program in Steve as an exhibition unfolding throughout the year. He co-curated um, the display and the live program at the opening of the Blavatnik building in 2016, the BMW live exhibition in 2017 and 18, the Hyundai Turbine Hall Commission by Philippe Pereno in 2016, and the expanded exhibition Joan Jonas in 2018. He's also served as curator at the Hangar Bicocca, uh, a lecturer at both the Brera Academy and Bocconi University and the co-founder of Vidrome, an online screening program for artists and filmmakers. I was saying before we started the um, session that in fact, it's quite a long list. I could go on and on with the things that Andrea has impressively done. Um, but at this point, I will turn over the presentation to Andrea. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Stephen. I, I take uh, exactly the two lines that you sent me at the beginning of our exchanges uh, on focusing on something that was relevant for my own development, uh, how it was conceptualized, how it was conceived, but also the challenges that I had to face and that we had to face because we always somehow work together and how those challenges it were um, solved. So it is not so much about what I did, uh, but it's so much, it's more about focusing on some moments and specific moments. Um, I can help on the introduction, why so much? Because actually I ended up uh, working as um, a curator within an institution relatively recently. Um, about, let's say, uh, 13 years ago. So it's a little bit more than a decade. And I have been working in very different environments beforehand and um, and working on like conceiving and putting something together in form of festival, in form of live exhibitions, but um, very rarely like uh, engaging with the uh, uh, actual white cube. And this, I think, is one of the lines that go throughout all my career or my life, or my working life, I, despite having worked at the Tate Modern where there are white cube situation, I've been always asked to um, be, um, be part of something was in transformation, something was about to be launched or something to be, uh, re re to be renovated. And was characteristic was not being traditional white cube space. So what I will do now is I will uh, share my screen um with a um uh, powerpoint that is uh, just a extremely long i wonder now okay extremely long i will skip so much i will run through a couple of um couple of projects and i um will try also to make sure i am in time i start from places because as i say places are uh, quite relevant and important to the way i've been setting um, projects. I never worked on specific exhibitions. I always work on the idea of a long-term program. And when I had the opportunity to be in a position of leading or conceiving this program, so therefore since about 12, 13 years, um, I always uh, worked on building something in which everything was connected throughout thinking not about one show, one show, one show, a sequence of concepts, but like an entire array which builds up with the main aim to generate a dialogue based often on bodily perception rather than on seeing and reading with local communities, like with a town, with an area, with where the institution stays and lives. 
This is Sanga Bicocca, it's a um, huge uh, former factory on the north side of Milan, where in 12, 2012, I um, organized a um, um, exhibition, it's a, a sort of, let's call it an exhibition, a project by artist Thomas Saracen, um, was titled, was on space time form. Um, this area, this gray space is called the queue. Uh, you see the height of the people, so therefore you have to imagine that uh, people that are uh, walking on this sort of plastic first layer are above 15 meters high over the head of the people underneath. And uh, this would be the view you see from underneath. Um, and this would be the feeling you will have when you are on top of the third layer of this sculpture, uh, structured in three different layers, non-communicating, you will access to uh, the three layers separately, and you will find yourself in a situation of floating up and down, depending on where you will be walking. Um, I may have, this is a other uh, image, and therefore finding yourself in an environment where not only you could uh, be exposed to risk, fear, transparency, vertiginous, but where you were in a complete situation of what is now called interdependency. If two people go too close to each other, they generate a sort of hole they cannot climb out or from. So it is a whole, let's say, structure in which the game at stake is not only experiencing the space differently, the environment differently, but also coordinating um, with other um, colleagues, peers, friends, or unknown uh, um, uh, people that are either literally one layer underneath or one layer above. And this you can see an image, and this you can see an image from inside. Um, the project was um, extremely challenging to be set, extremely uh, experimental for the artist. The material, the sort of transparent material, the material that is used in uh, aerospatial technology, uh, particularly for balloons, for flying balloons. And, and it took a real challenge to fix in a safe way this sort of um, plastic transparent material on the on the frames you can see here. Do you see my mouse? I suppose yes. So uh, these are the frames I'm mentioning and making so sure that these were safe and, and not collapsing, obviously. <laughs> and um, and as you can see, it's quite high up. There's a sort of uh, trampoline, a sort of stairs from which you enter. So how uh, I what I'm missing, what we are missing here is one fundamental Duchampian element, air. I mean, how the whole stays up, it stays up with hot air. So we needed compressors to put uh, into an environment that needed to be completely closed with a system of double doors. The pressure would have been quite high to keep the entire structure, the sort of lasagna we used to call it back then, floating. Project was absolutely groundbreaking for me, for the artists, for the team working on it. There was absolutely no preparation to set something like this. There have been a lot of studies, um, I would say informal studies and uh, formal studies had been set in a record time. How this thing went up after having tried enormously by, um, uh, by, by using cranes and bringing up like four cranes, bringing up the whole plastic material, so to say, and then fixing on a sort of frame of wood. How did we make this? Didn't work because the material was too heavy and it was collapsing on the cranes and was extremely dangerous despite trying to inflate hot water. How did we manage? We managed with the unexpected, uh, uh, almost last minute, like a week before intervention of a group of uh, carpenters that were like working like literally next to the to the to the institution to the former factory that set up a system of um, beads sort of scaffolding on top of which uh, the plastic was really laid uh, horizontally and it was growing up and then slowly being dismantled and coming down to, in order to fix all different layers so a system that nobody would have imagined but actually enabled to fix on the frames, on the wooden frames, um, the, the big horizontal, um, let's say, uh, surfaces that will be then worked by, by the audiences. 
Uh, why I'm saying this? I'm saying this, why I'm stressing this? I'm saying this because this is the first time it was clear to me. I mean, I've been always working with rather um, um, challenging spaces, like uh, quite big, big spaces, but it was the first time in which I understood that uh, my job wasn't about uh, so much about um, um, the academical training I had, but it was very much about trying to um, understand what does it mean to read the space, to um, suggest the right figures, uh, the right colleagues, and also to build a team in which the fundamental figure of the exhibition maker, the exhibition producer, was someone who didn't necessarily have as traditionally, particularly in Germany, right now, a background in um, uh, architecture design or exhibition design, but someone who comes most from theater or from the opera or from festival making, someone who uh, can see the space and can interpret the space in a different way, in a different manner, and providing sol solution to works that are not only challenging, but the kind of works I've been always um, committed to. What are the works I'm committed to? The works I'm committed to are often non-object based, I often work that uh, have been laid out of the history of art, that history that starts particularly in Italy uh, from Lucio Fontana onwards with the word ambienti, and then transitions to the US to um, Alan Capro, but only, and becomes the environments until the point when in the mid 70s, the world somehow fades, disappears, and, and we and emerges in the new world that uh, in the 80s would become installation, a world, a terminology that didn't exist. So this sort of uh, obsession, preoccupation I had for environments, for artists been working with environments in the present day, in the past, is something that um, I'm, I'm following it, I'm, I'm, I'm working it, and I had for a long time, maybe for, from ever. So main challenge, how to bring up this in a safe way, how to make it work, how to support the visionary idea of an artist that realized something that will never do after until the show he had last year in New York at the Shell. It was based on completely different premises and intention, but was feedback into this um, early project he made in Milan. That on the point of view of the contents, the lines, the intention, I want frame, I could do it in another moment, but I actually really wanted to frame what was the challenge we, we, we had to deal with. Of course, the main challenge, the one that we never consider in a museum environments are two. As soon as the work begins, because the work begins its life uh, or their life in the moment you open, that's not the definitive ending of, of of, of, a, of, a, of, an, of an endeavor. The, food, the two challenges are first, safety, maximum safety. How do you generate a safe environment for everyone? And second, what you never think, but it's fundamental. How do you deal? How do you work with a team that has been working maybe for many years on guarding and move this team, the team that we will call now visitor experience, into a totally different way of engaging? in generating the premises to run an experience and to engage and deal with the audiences completely differently. There have been trauma, there have been uh, you know, crisis, there have been moments of challenge because it was cold, the team had to wear special materials, it was very hot inside the environment underneath, there were queues, there were need to share, but on the other hand, there was a need to generate a safe experience, and then we had to hire professional Climbers to be on the upper slaver level, uh, three of them always ready to jump into if someone was panicking, needed to be picked out, or maybe slipping and not being able to, to come out from, from this uh, environment. It's like, say, a new or different kind of artwork. This is the micro, um, uh, let's say, a group of human beings that are part of an institution or, an, uh, let's say, event driven. Um, project that are fundamental to guarantee what is the, the most important safety and a, um, an experience as close as possible to the one the artist would like to to generate and to produce. Um, I 
Of course, if you Google or you go on the website of Hunger Bicocca, you'll find far more information and also all the historical uh, reason why this work happened to be presented here and what it, what was it connected. Um, I would like to follow with follow up with, uh, this is how the space looks, the space of Hunger Bicocca, when it's empty, there is a the big um, cube I was mentioning when Thomas Saracen who made the work is underneath here. It's a concrete uh, big cube with a sequence of um, windows on the top high level. The space otherwise is complete in the dark. It's like a perfect Hollywood studio. And there is no natural light and it's heavily charged by its past, haunted maybe by his past. It's two big uh, wings uh, divided by columns and it's like about 30 meters high and um, about um, uh, 50 meters large. So I cannot translate in feet. Um, I'm showing you uh, an exhibition project I conceived and I um, realized together with artist John Jonas, who uh, I'm sure you are familiar with and will be having a solo exhibition next year in New York at the moment, um, a retrospective, finally deserved. Um, this is the first time um, that her work has been put together all in a row, in, um, in a sequence, by making sure, by purpose, not to isolate the words, but rather to keep them in dialogue. And this is something I've been obsessed with from ever. I am someone who never builds words, or and nowadays, luckily, it has to do also with ecological concerns, but I'm never for building walls. Uh, I'm always for trying to uh, give to the works the room they deserve and to make works echoing and reflecting and mirroring, possibly acknowledging artistic practices I uh, love and I want to support, like the one of John Jonas. Artistic practices in, uh, in which the artist maybe move ahead by constantly going back resampling or reporting, remedying herself or themselves throughout time and therefore bringing the work uh, far ahead. Um, this sequence of installation, it was like 14 installations next to each other. Some of them, most of them were actually original. Some of them were replicas. Um, really shaped a new stage on the career of Joan. And I, I know she keeps saying this uh, because not only she could see them all in, a, in all together, but also she realized how much her work is completely interconnected. So by providing uh, an exhibition that was a huge challenge for me, <laughs> um, not to isolate, but rather to display and echo, and for the artists as well, how not to be overwhelmed by such an uh, array of works, we also um, enable the artist to make a new step a new step that brought her to um, the American Pavilion to represent in the US in 2015 at the Venice Biennial, and for the first time to generating environments of works, that like building works together. Um, the curatorial trick will be that this works, that this work that is now in display at the Dia Beacon, uh, maybe for one more week, uh, that disappeared from the history. I found it by complete chance um, in a storage in New York had in itself the key, the bodily perception key of the show. This work is called The Shape, Descent, the Feel of Things, 2006, was actually produced at the Abicom. And there is a drawing here on a of a snake, a drawing uh, of a snake inspired to the snake uh, Warburg uh, mentioned as a fundamental uh, ritual in the in, in, in Edward, uh, the, the scholar, the, the fundamental figure in art history, in uh, his encounter with the Hopi culture. This snake is a drawing that exactly represents the display of the show. So I kind of follow this snake. This is where we are. And then the works are displayed this way. And at the end, where the spiral is, is where we display reanimation. Um, this is how the space looked and you can see how the borders, the edges between one work and the other were quite fragile, but still we managed to respect them. And um, what was uh, the challenge of this display or what was the challenge of this uh, exhibition? The challenge of this exhibition was basically, um, again, trying to um, produce for the first time for me, an enormous timeline 
not related to the chronology of the works of the artist, but to how to install the exhibition. A timeline that has to do with a huge amount of crates and a huge amount of, not such a huge amount of crates, a huge amount of technology and a huge amount of tasks to be set in a specific little timeline. Within three weeks, all this will need to be taken shape. How do you do it? How do you do it? How do you generate uh, with the artist without stressing, without having too many uh, moments of resting, moments of frustration with a team that has to advance you cannot you employ 80 people, you have like a team of 12, 14. How do you generate all this crossover and how you uh, timeline um, every single competence? The media technician, the art handlers, and the conservators. And how you make sure you don't, you don't make them clashing and how you make sure the conservators with the objects are the last one that come in in order for the object not to be um, 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 uh, damage by uh, someone moving around technology or someone like moving around the space with machines. So it's not an immediate problem you would imagine, but this taught me everything about how to how to 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 see time not only in art history but also in displaying relevant practices in art history. Uh, the following show in the very same space, in the show that resonates because it was co coincided together with Armour in New York. Um, and it was a show by Philippe Parreno. I decided to choose artists I've been working consistently with so that I kind of saw, I kind of seen or the same rhymes in different situations. And the challenges would be always different. Uh, but I, in this like run through, I decided to to focus on some artists I constantly work with because maybe it's interesting to see how the discourse and the conversation evolved. Um, and in this case, uh, the main challenge was similar to the one of John Jonas, imagining a survey of one specific feature in the work of Philippe Parreno, the Marquis, running a sort of impeccable line of all Marquis Philippe Parreno has made that was a sort of uh, light line in the show. And at the same time, uh, making this not cold and technical as I experienced it in New York, but warm and, um, um, and bodily and, uh, and, and generating a, a sort of big environment. And this we did by setting a sort of screen at the center of the space, uh, which was presenting a selection of the works, uh, the filmic works of Philippe Parreno. And, using the Marquis array as ampli uh, loudspeakers and, and visual and, and real loudspeakers. So to, let's say, expanding film within the space and through sound. Um, challenge was obviously um, how to install this heavy object that are stateless. I'm very much interested in stateless objects, right? objects that are neither artworks, neither props, um, objects that are like uh, musical instruments. It can be an, an artwork when it's played or when it's under a uh, under glass, but actually should be used. So is it an artwork or is it an instrument? And I've been always working across this uh, um, this stateless, so to say, situation, transitioning situation, what in philosophy are called the quasi-objects, the objects that have, have not full status. And Philippe Parreno is one of the artists who is the most probably acknowledged in this specific field. Um, obviously, the, the other challenge is um, how do you mediate this when, when you have to do with an audience, and this obviously you can see the space is rather spectacular, but then the audience wants to engage, understand, and relate. What are the experiences? Is this, where is the artwork? Where is the border between the one of the other? Uh, what is this? What kind of experience is this? Why this is a, is a solo show that at the same time is a survey? that actually is a chronological survey of a major line of works in the artist. Mediating all this is one of the biggest challenges. And uh, I usually will do it by using the work themselves, the, making the work speaking by themselves and trying to um, tell and share the story they have and what they are and represent. But by doing this, I tend, and probably this is also a problem, to generate exhibition project in which everything, like saying, comes together and what the edges between the isolated white cube set artwork somehow disappear and become something else. Um, 
When I moved to the Tate, I had to do with a completely different uh, challenge, but a very, um, an amazing one. The challenge was, there was a new building, um, as you can see, as you know, it's now called Blavatnik building, but then it was called Switch House, um, that transformed completely the urbanistic of the, and the functioning of the institution. It was like a one-way wing, and now it is a cross, um, um, it's a crossover, like from north to south with a new structure, with a new building on the side. So I think this is one of the reasons why I've been uh, asked to join uh, the day because of my experience in Milan and my experience with space and festivals. This is the space outside. We imme immediately started thinking about how to work not so much on the inside, but on how you approach the building. And that's the first time I work with artist Fuji Konakaya um, in conceiving a fox sculpture that will be seen from the outside and will be generating the feeling of a public artwork, a constantly transforming public artwork. That it's somehow an environment that is shapeless, that has no, uh, no contained shape, but is also something that needs to be um, managed technically. And once again, the huge challenge was uh, how, what do you do with the, with the knowledge of museum, of institution like museum in which an art handler doesn't know what, how to protect uh, pipes and, and pumps, or a um, technician doesn't know how to give shape to something that is considered a sculpture by the artist, and the artist herself spends a long time in the space to understand temperature, why wind, and, and, and movement of uh, made only by water sculpture that then can affect the building and for instance, end up on the windows and making the windows cover on them and so on. So all these are issues that we engage with, with joy and with, um, with uh, commitment. Uh, we call Fuji Konakaya for the simple reason that the area where I was mostly working was called the tanks that were fit with oil. Uh, it's a, Tate was a former um, power station. And so we, and this is why I'm always talking about bodily perception. We thought it would be interesting to deal with an artist that uses a medium that's a fundamental medium, like nowadays, like water, a female artist, and already the entire thinking about hydrofeminism was, was going on and was developed, that is participative, engaging, but at the same time, keeps the memory alive in some way about what is, uh, what is the underground life of the, what the institution today is. The times of the day look like this, and um, we answered this uh, question on how to change exhibition making for spaces that are not conventionally white, but are uh, raw, um, concrete, um, made, and, and also um, non-typical uh, for art through um, live exhibition, so exhibition that unfold in time rather than in space. Therefore, uh, this is a group show I conceived in by the sang with Fred Morton, um, and Isabel Lewis, uh, Camp, uh, Lorenzo Senni, um, uh, Phil Niblock, uh, Carlos Casas, and this is again, again Isabel Lewis, and this is uh, Fujiko Nakaya. Um, and the outcome of this project and the challenge of this project and the frustration of this project was it is impossible to witness it. It, was, it happened in 2016. It was very hard to document it. It's very hard to make um, a big audience how the one, uh, the one of the Tate is, uh, understanding what does it mean not to have a work always there, but a work that manifests. It is really challenging to, of course, deal with uh, sequences of putting in time seas of um, artworks that sometimes appear in form of objects, sometimes appear in form of uh, events, uh, by considering the entire dress rehearsal moment, like the sound check if it's a concert, the rehearsal if it's a live performance, the uh, pre-setting if it's a fox sculpture. How do you make all this? It's an incredibly and fascinating challenge on thinking time, not as it's gonna be seen by the audience, but as it needs to be staged to be seen and experienced by the audiences. And this, I guess, is one of the biggest challenges I love most and that I try to, to engage with that bring me uh, and bring the institution where I work in a state of transformation that sometimes is challenging for the institution themselves in which 
particularly in a case like the one where I am here in Munich at Kausa Kunz, where the transition from a logistic driven uh, exhibition making, logistic driven may, may I mean like exhibition that collects objects coming from all over the world, their own base that appear and then we are sent back. Um, a model that was very well known until now into a model in which it is very much about on-site producing. And therefore the key figure, let's say the registrar becomes a time manager. The registrar becomes a producer, if it's ever possible. And it's not always possible, but this is the aim. And as the registrar, which is a clear example of a figure, a fundamental figure working in the, in the institution goes with uh, um, the exhibition maker, let's say the exhibition display responsible who becomes a producer that looks after more works to be produced at the same time, rather than a um, installer, rather than someone who displays. And this is a real shift in, um, in, in exhibition conceiving and program conceiving. It is not a shift that has necessarily to do with the future. I mean, it's a shift that can ground into the present or in the past. I'm mostly talking about artists that, like Fujiko Nakai at the moment is 89 years old. So her practice goes back to the early 70s. It's not, we're not talking about artists that are doing works now. So the artists that because of the practice have been left out from the history. And the practice is sometimes uh, always actually groundbreaking if not game changing. Uh, with Philippe Parenon, in the year uh, that the, how, uh, the Turbine Hall um, changed its function from being a front uh, wing to a crossover, we uh, conceived this work, uh, this intervention in Turbine Hall that uh, consisted of screens coming up and down from above, loudspeakers coming up and down from above, carrying sound, obviously, system of lights being completely changed and following uh, um, the, the principle of the meeting, you know, the DMX system, which basically makes light working as if it was sound, or lights following sound, um, into an, an, an array of events that was unfolding following a script that was co-scripted by the artist and a series of East, uh, not bacteria, but East, that were, they were running a sort of control room, and the East were reacting to changes, parameters that were uh, local parameters, the, the wind, the temperature, the outside wind, the outside temperature, the presence of sun, and how these parameters are constant, constantly changing will affect the behavior of this East living in a sort of laboratory, in the isolated laboratory system, that were um, changing their patterns to amounts of sugar they were receiving if this pattern were changing. I can express better, but you can find out what I mean. But what was the challenge? Well, the challenge was the Tate model is a completely, uh, let's say, registrar-based institution, art and a registrar-based institution, institution. So normally they hang stuff in the turbine hall or they put stuff on the floor or they make a crack in the case of Doris Salcedo, but they never ever would have imagined to uh, install an entire kind of theatrical machine that was constantly changing, would be occasionally becoming a cinema and occasionally becoming a completely empty environment. This has been extremely challenging for an entire institution. Since then, the institution has changed completely the pattern. They had specific uh, figures only to deliver the turbine hall project. They decided to alternate <laughs> turbine hall projects, as you can see. Like, quiet ones to very challenging ones. So after Anikai doesn't follow <laughs> Philippe Areno, but follows Cecilia Vicuña. And, and this is the pattern they decided to give the possibility to the institution to rest and to breathe, because obviously these projects are challenging and are planned long time, uh, long time ahead. And, and therefore they had to set a new department that is focalized and specialized in running different kinds of machine. And this project was a pilot project. Everything you see here is hanging on grids, uh, hanging on uh, or either on the, on, the, on the pipes, or either on the beams of the, let's say, building itself, or on a system of um, uh, suspended system of um, beams that through engines and motors were going up and down. Again, the main issue was safety. Uh, you end up being under, you end up lying here on the floor listening, watching, but you're actually under a mobile, huge mobile structure above you. It must be really safe. 
extremely safe, but if not safe, then you encounter a problem that can be uh, dramatic for institutions. So how to generate these patterns, how to make sure this is not an exhibition in which you pay a ticket, but it is open to whomever enters the turbine hall. This being extremely challenging and seeming beautiful, extremely um, groundbreaking for me and for the institution. This is a moment when it becomes a cinema, I was saying, you know, every panel will come down and will then uh, generate a cinema that will then disappear and fill up in the space. Um, one of the main challenges was also like fundraising for this, for this project. The project was extremely uh, expensive and the, in the budget for the budget that the Tate can, um, can give, which is always supported by a, a company, is about one third of what the, the final budget of the, uh, of the project. Well, one of, one of the main supports came from a company called Quadrat. I'm still working with, by the way, occasionally. This company produces, a Danish company produces um, high-end textiles, and they understood that the textiles that were about to put on the market that are very specifically conceived for sound, uh, either soundproof or working specifically with sound, will have been incredibly uh, in, interesting for this project. So we got on in kind this array of textile that we then uh, fit on um, on frames and transform the screens, generating a sort of um, machine that had many references in art, but uh, at, the, at the point uh, didn't have any reference in the current status of the art. Um, oh my God, this is a group show I had many challenges with, I love, but I think it makes no sense to look at this. We are now, I guess, 10 minutes more. This is the House of Kunst, the institution where I work now. And Fujiko Nakaya came back. Uh, this is a photo at the Tate. Uh, this was my first show um, at House of Kunst, changing completely the way of working. Uh, okay, you can see there is a sort of, um, we opened all the doors towards uh, east facing a uh, creek, actually a sort of a canal that runs alongside the institution, which is quite well known because it's, it's a hot spot for surfer that come from all over the world and surf. So we generated a sort of wave of water running through from the building through the canal. And then there are all geophysic uh, notes. I won't tell you on how the fog made of water works, but they are fundamental. But obviously, obviously uh, making a system, uh, installing a system of pipes above here, uh, tanks and pumps, uh, enabling the fox culture to manifest every seven minutes for like about two minutes was a huge challenge that I can only uh, look back and smile about, but, uh, but has been uh, extremely stressful for everyone. And not as a following challenge, I will show you, particularly in, a, in an institution that's been run brilliantly for eight years by Oakley and Denzel, with an astonishing project, but as I said before, hence mostly um, logistics based. This is what we made within the main room of the institution, which is a huge room. Um, the show we had, we consider a show in which I presented all different moments of life of the artist Nakaya. In every room, there was um, a work that can run through the show. You can see the doors are open. These are different works. This is a screen, the projection of previous work. You can see how the rooms alongside the main room are. From every room, you will see the following room, the previous room. These are a photo for sculpture. These are early works. If how it imagine, you can read the date, 1973, 2022. There are spiders inside here. Other challenges that have to do with living animals. This is the fog that is like spilling out from the main room and entering in a space where there are screens. There is an entrance here. These are early work from the 70s, uh, early video works. And these are, again, early video works projected 73, 74. So Fujiko Nakai in the early 70s was someone who could be uh, put in dialogue with artists like uh, Peter Campos, Dan Graham, the Viola, um, um, Vito Conci, and almost only quoting males, because actually the history you want to stress is the one of uh, uh, Shijiko Kubota, John Jonas, Fujiko Nakai, and so on. So, um, mm. but the let's say, a uh, fundamental path that brought Fujiko Nakaya moving out from video to fog, we tried to bridge and put together other rooms like this. She was a painter in the 50s, painting painter of clouds. How did you manage to isolate 
painting, spray juice painting from fog made of water was a fantastic challenge I can speak a lot about. And this is an early installation that functioned as many works then Bill Viola would have developed. Um, there were also rooms with uh, materials, archival materials, and so on. What I wanted to tell you quickly is how did we manage to present this? A sort of, you can go online on the website of Joseph Kunz and you see what it is about, but this is basically a pond. Uh, on top of this, on, of, the, of it, there is a fog sculpture that takes shape every 15 minutes. Suspends itself in the air, goes almost up to fill the entire room, makes the height of the room, which is again about 12 meters old, uh, cut in two, and slowly, slowly, slowly collapse and ends up in the basin of water that collects the water because water causes water, although it's microparticle of water. And when this sort of miracle appears, the sculpture takes place. Also, you see a system of loudspeakers here. Uh, that are connected to camera, that track the form of the fog taking shape and accompany through a sound, a specific sound wave, composed sound wave that specifically was composed by a um, well known musician, Ryuchi Sakamoto. Um, obviously, uh, fog sculpture made of water appearing every 50 minutes, every day, four times a week, four times an uh, hour is the biggest challenge a museum can face. Why? Because first, normally you have like air conditioning system that are all interconnected. And then water can, like particle of water can go all over the galleries. Second, because you imagine um, the walls are going to be completely um, covered in moss in, within a few <laughs> days. And third, because you, you encounter issue with the audience that can slip into the water, can slip in the space, so all this we resolved to an uh, extremely theatrically driven mind of a team of uh, the, um, uh, now set exhibition maker and, and, and somehow producer, a very little team, very visionary and, and supportive, that together with the artists conceived this, again, environment that was safe, that enabled us to, to bring a ritual within the institution, which is what I care most, and to generate a different way of um, engaging and participating not so much with the work, but towards audiences, towards the public. That was not a waiting for a spectacle to manifest, but was about to cross and encounter a different way of intending sculpture. Um, oops, I went too fast now. Um, obviously, um, there are challenges of any kind in this project, like personal challenges, uh, challenges with the artist, uh, challenges with working with an artist that lives in another country that cannot travel because she's 88, she was 88, Japan was completely sealed, it's so possible to leave Japan during COVID, and, and she's not keen on working throughout, through Zoom, so it's been a journey, but it's been the most rewarding journey of my life so far, and it's been comparable to the Saraceno project I was telling you about, or the many Philippe Parino projects we're working with, and it was a challenge that enabled also to make, I guess, the extraordinary career of this artist becoming public and, and taking visibility at least once uh, outside Japan. And, and of course, there are many other art historic uh, layers I would like to, uh, I could share, but it makes no sense to share. Um, what is the challenge for the, for the institution? The challenge for the institution is not so much communicating, but running this thing. There is a fox sculpture exactly outside here. This floor is slippery. So you have to find a system to ask visitor service to make sure the, stay, the floor is wet, is not wet, but it's like dry. How do you do it? And how do you generate a sort of uh, kinship that enables everyone to take care of a sculpture as if it was a pet. To take care of a sculpture, a mutable sculpture, as if it was an animal that needs to be fed and looked after with the aim of not so much preserving and feeding the sculpture, but actually making sure that the audience is always in a safe situation and feels in a safe situation. And um, of course, there are micro challenges of any kind, how the technology doesn't get affected by the, the mist, the, the moist in the air and so on. But these are specifically 
different and I'm happy to, to speak about this in other moments. Um, I wanted to go back in the two minutes I still have to a show I could work at the tape, partially in the tanks, partially in, in the galleries of what is now called the Blavatnik building that was meant to travel to Hossa Kunz, didn't because of, let's say, um, tragic and dramatic problems, but now came back and is back, is now in the galleries next to YM. And what I wanted to show now is um, somehow uh, how we managed to uh, stage um, a in completely different environment uh, of artworks by uh, respecting the thinking and the conceiving of the artist. In this case, I think you may can guess we decided to kick out the store, the shop at the end of an exhibition. We knew there will have been so much marketing support, so much merchandise uh, for John Jonas. It was like a C exhibition within the program of the day, not the A one. And then it ended up being going very far better than what we expected. And so we, we used the shop space to display works, to generate a new path. And we used every possible corner of the institution to display works that were not dangerous to be handled or pressure to be handled because they're all exhibition copies or artist proof of the artist no? and, and, and particularly fragile but yet uh, stable enough or safe enough to be set in this case. And the same challenge, oh, this is a surfer that witnessed how it is true that one of the most uh, relevant hotspots in Europe for service next to the House of Queens. And this very challenge uh, we faced when we reinstalled the show with a different, let's say, approach here at the House of Queens by using exactly the same uh, wood we had in the floor for Fuji Konaka, this is the same room where the fox sculpture was, but facing new problems. One of the problems is, this work called reanimation normally has four freestanding screens, but we couldn't have the freestanding screens here, and we couldn't hang anything on the on the on the ceiling. But um, because there is no, we cannot carry weight. So we, instead of giving up to this work, a work that is fundamental in the career of John Jonah, who was in display at MoMA when MoMA uh, reopened it with a new rehang, we suggested the art as a system of grids are both the four screens that we, have, we will have mainly visible by painting them white, in which the space uh, across every pipe is exactly the beam, exactly the same space of the squares that structure the, the, the screen she makes. And we will have painted white to make them invisible, but becoming not only holding, but also support structure for technology. So this is one of the little, um, let's say, um, Thoughts one has to push with the production team to get into the state of displaying something, otherwise, it will give up and take out from a checklist. And these are the same works we saw before in a totally different environment from a different approach and perspective. And, and I think I could I could easily stop here because maybe this is the time to um, to go to some questions. I have far more. And, but as I said, as I, I was suggested correctly from uh, Stephen, it makes no sense that I, I, we work on histories, on narrative, and, um, and, and why we do this, but more on challenges. And I hope I kind of answered to some uh, problems and issues that were mostly technical, but not only. I did it up to you, Stephen, to- Great. Uh, yeah. yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, this is the time for people to put a question into the Q&A. Um, I think just to, while people do that, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments and questions, which is, you know, it's fascinating the way that you began about body perception, bodily perception, um, talking about installation, and really that kind of move from your training as an art historian, et cetera, to um, thinking of your profession as a kind of dramaturge where it's a theatrical space in a way and you have to respond to that and you spoke about um, you know the phenomenological term of quasi objects of the the semi agency of the object itself and I wondered if you could just talk about that kind of in in the way that you conceive shows the 
physicality or the haptic nature of the way that you understand phenomenologically bodies in space with objects in space as a form of um, what could be called um, activated knowledge production. Absolutely. I'm touched you say this this way. This is exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> it's exactly that, in the sense that I have been... Um, there is a reason why, why we present this kind of works almost only at Hausa Kunz. The reason is Hausa Kunz has no collection. And, and having been committed for so long, and you know, I think you can find interviews on the website of the Tate uh, in the collection care research, where I was somehow uh, very much involved in, um, in conserving, preserving, migrating time-based media uh, artworks. Having been involved in so much in that, I thought that the best this institution can do is making surfacing artworks that has slipped out from the art history, making them visible, and then generating the opportunity for other institutions, that collect institutions, to collect the manual of this artwork and making them appear when necessary, if this is ever possible. So this is sort of like in within uh, interinstitutional, let's say, commitment. Um, not by chance, we had a whole team of MoMA here uh, when we opened the show of Joel, because it's an incredibly opportunity to, to work on this. But where do I learn, where did I learn this? This I learned this approach that you're talking about. Uh, on the one hand, as a rejection from the um, illustrative and comparative approach to art history I grew up with, like the, that very specific one where without the label, the work almost doesn't exist. Uh, the one that kind of Joseph Kossuth uh, made a parody of somehow, but actually, and then it went, worked on this, but actually from that frustration, uh, a word appeared, and the word was the word of artists like John, like and Fujiko Nakaya, or like Rebecca Horn, or like that's obviously the entire list uh, of, of artists that uh, Suruko Yamazaki, artists from, from, from Gutai to Marta Minumin, to, you know, to, uh, from um, Alexandra Kazuba to speak about an experience in New York to, uh, to Nanda Vigo. Anyway, there are so many of that decided, committed to uh, generate a um, form of specific knowledge that were preoccupied with and by that we could ascribe to the field of sculpture, but actually was uh, also featuring other questions, like in the case of John, what are uh, uh, our what is our position in the world as animals no? and how do you share our world with animals that are um, non-human no? what is climate catastrophe and why a work like reanimation that started in 2009 uh, from the let's say from the inspiration of hello blacksness um, under the glacial uh, text is a fundamental tool nowadays to think about what is glacial melting and how john set a work that is completely based on uh, bodily perception that also has this uh, specific, let's say, layer within without being illustrative, without like being mm, literal, without being uh, top, uh, bottom, didascalic. So, um, and this in an institution that like this, where I am now, that has been in the last years burdened by um, uh, trauma and misunderstandings and uh, an idea of exclusivity, despite having carried the fantastic measure of post-coloniality, was for me an important step in the transformation. No? Also, I'm obviously like a son of the of the 90s, and I grew up in a moment where a uh, revolution happened in music and, and in arts, and everything was in like became relational and started merging. So this is also driven by uh, an approach on transmediality, uh, transdisciplinarity. Okay, uh, let's move to questions. So Renee says, are there any videos that capture at least some pieces of the 10 days and six nights performance at Tate? Dramatically, yes, but they are raw. They haven't been edited because one of the big, major issues in institution, mastodontic institution like the Tate, hopefully no longer in the future, but in the past, have been what is called resources. And resources, you focus always on priority. And priority, I'm using a specific jargon, museum jargon. And priorities are unfortunately not necessarily documenting, but mm -hmm. like uh, making happen and getting audiences in. This is not a critique, it's just a status of thing that you uh, have to face when you move in this kind of uh, uh, 
mastodontic institution no? that are also surviving, mostly surviving through the uh, revenues that they generate themselves. No? And therefore, documenting, unfortunately, is not a priority. But yes, it's documented, just raw. Nobody had the resources to edit it <laughs> and to okay. make it. <laughs> um, okay. And we have an anonymous attendee who asks, what advice would you give curators who are at the very beginning of their career? <laughs> <laughs> to follow your, your course. I mean, it looks amazing. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> it's really like fantastic the way uh, it's structured and and, uh, and I had the, the privilege of having a hosting last year, a young, um, um, a young student. And I hope she was extremely influenced by the way we work here. So the only the fact that we were, uh, were reached out to host the students from the course makes me think that it's excellent because she was fantastic. So it seems the most obvious, but I've ever done. <laughs> Thank you for the plug. Um, so next question, how do you get funding for works for which there is no permanent collection? I do have one with you, but well, I'm lucky because I work in an institution is like publicly funded, 70%, uh, 65% and generates 35% uh, to um, its own revenues. Uh, it's like the various forms. So it's like we can manage within the budget what we do. Um, and it's just a matter of like, Thinking differently. I mean, this, the, the venue where you see the Fujiko Nakai exhibition is a venue where you normally open the door and if you make like a object-based show, it can't cost less than 700,000 euros. Impossible. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. You can get to generating these artworks with that money. It's just a different way of thinking. It's just a lie, like, how can we be more ecologically driven and sustainable by producing on site and, and using differently these resources we have? It just, when, as soon as you enter, if you ever enter in a, a museum environment, you realize what the real costs are and how you could work differently. The problem is a question of mentality. You know? Obviously, an old fashioned way of thinking is you have to make the sandwich, you need a blockbuster, and you need a non artist. The blockbuster you can make. That's what I what I think. And you respect this. So it's not that you need to choose among the five that are iconic and belong to the 20th century. Okay. Um, hi, Andrea. Thanks for this presentation. You've worked with some incredibly ambitious artists throughout your career. More of a practical question. Can you speak about how you approach the commissioning process with artists, especially when artists have very ambitious ideas that sometimes outsize the institution's budget or resources? You've kind of answered that already, but. Well, in general, the, 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 the step is first approaching artists that already feature, not so much the scale in, within the work, but the ambition in reconsidering the work and um, that um, in which you offer a possibility of uh, open a perspective that it's covering the span of the work. It's not about like you do this project, but this project uh, embodies all previous one that you can mirror somewhere within the work itself or within the work. So this is a possibility that to, for the artist that is quite, um, quite fascinating so that's the first uh, common ground you can work with. it's not that you have like you are like part of a very rich you know private foundation that can do whatever they want it's more uh, it's a real critical uh, curatorial conversation you know? and and this is how it for me worked so far and then of course you build a sort of legacy you have an approach and within a specific community this approach is slowly and acknowledged so last question, um, which is in a way also related, which is about the relationship with the artist. Um, Arts Cabinet asks, as you create spaces and installations which aim to generate connections, experience with publics, you engage with the artists about the display of their work. Do they participate in the setting of the space? Obsessively. Uh, the main investment here is moving human beings and not moving um, and not moving goods. Uh, therefore, we have a strand of the other code is called Tune. Every once a month, we give visibility to a musician or an artist that work with sound. And I am completely against the gig culture. 
the very same artist, the Alvin Carano of Yun Lee, will come probably twice to the house of coins. And for the first time, looking at the spaces and then coming back, making a proposal, and coming back. And then we need, we ask them or her, like to live, maybe the first they ever did, uh, and the most recent, a collaboration, a screening, a listening session, dialogue. And this becomes effective, not only if we had opportunity to spend time with the artists as much as we can, but the artists are familiarity with the spaces and, and, and also can engage with the circulation of the audiences in the spaces, which is very, very important. Not, as I say, I call it the urbanistic, but it's not really such an urbanistic, it's more like the behavioral, let's say, feeling of the spaces and, and how they are used. Right, so with that, let me thank you uh, for the public presentation and thanks everyone for coming. Next week, by the way, um, our speaker will be Su Wei, a um, Beijing based art critic and curator. So please join us for that. And uh, with that, thanks, Andrea, and I will see you in the students in a moment. Bye. Thank you so much. It was fantastic. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao.